this is talking about the Autodesk product design and manufacturing collection. Uh, we'll run through a quick introduction. I want to give you an overview of the collection itself. We'll talk a little bit about what's included in the collection, and then we'll get into some workflow demos. Uh, so these workflow demos are really designed to uh, get into the software. We'll start off in AutoCAD for the first one, make our way over to Inventor. Uh, and then we'll take a look at Inventor to Inventor Nastrin and Inventor to Fusion 360. So just some of these connected workflows that you will have access to um, if you have the collection or if you're looking at moving up to the collection from a standalone seat of Inventor or a standalone seat of AutoCAD. And that's really what the point of this webinar is for. If you have a standalone seat of one or the other and you're looking into the collection to see what it can offer you. My name is Jared Bowser, the manager of training services here at Mesa. I've been with Mesa for 15 years. I get to do a lot of different things. Primarily, I train. I'm an Autodesk certified instructor, as you can see listed there. But I also help out in other areas uh, and other services that we offer. I do consulting for customers. I also do product demonstrations for new or potential customers. We offer support. I take my turn uh, on the support line. Um, from time to time. So if you have an issue with your software, something breaks down, uh, we can always call in and, and ask us and we can help you out. And then I also help out on our design services team. We have a special team dedicated to assisting our customers with their own jobs. Uh, so if you get a little bit buried, a little bit behind, need a little bit of help, you can reach out to our design services team and uh, I help out there when I can. As you can see listed there too, I'm an inventor mechanical design certified professional. All right, so let's take a look at the product design and manufacturing collection. And as you can see there, the collection, it's a powerful set of applications. So we can extend our capabilities in either AutoCAD or Inventor just to help you create, design, or push beyond your custom products, your complex equipment, your systems. So we have a handful of add-ins for Inventor itself. These are tools that you would get in addition to the Inventor Professional software, including Inventor Nastran, uh, Inventor Tolerance Analysis, uh, even Inventor Cam. There's other tools like Factory Design Utility to help you lay out your factory floor. And then there's additional products, additional standalone software uh, like Fusion 360 or Navisworks or 3ds Max and even Recap Pro. So a handful of products that you're going to get uh, to help you out. And whether you're using one or two of those or you're using most of them, uh, looking at the collection and seeing what it can offer you and seeing how you could take what you're already doing and maybe push it to the next step is what we really want to focus on today. All right, so we want to start off with taking a look at the inventor tolerance analysis. And we just want to do kind of a quick overview of some of these different add-ins. You see a couple screenshots of each of those, uh, give you an overview of what you can do with them and what the, the tools are working in the background. Uh, and then, like I said, once we get through a handful of these, I'm gonna jump into a couple workflows. I'm not gonna workflow through everything, of course, but I wanted to highlight a couple workflows and uh, so you'll get to see a few of these live and in demo. So this tolerance analysis add-in, this will help your users make more informed decisions while looking at manufacturing tolerances. So we can accurately calculate the culminative effect of geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. We can verify manufacturing tolerances and we can communicate, excuse me, we can communicate those results. We can take a look at things like assembly fit with a tolerance stack up analysis and we could take a look at statistical results along the way. So right in the designer's hands, right at the early stage, stages, we could start looking at these things. And that's gonna be a common theme. Get these tools into the hands of the designer. Uh, that way we can make some of those decisions up front, which is gonna help us save time to market. And that's what Inventor Nastrian is all about. This is a finite element tool 
finite element analysis tool uh, designed for designers and engineers. So making those decisions early, even just to get close or get in the ballpark, as I like to say, uh, before you actually send these designs out to a, a, a PE or, or an engineer level. We have a wide range of simulation types in Nastrin. Uh, we start off with linear static analysis, which is what most people start with and most people use. But then we can move beyond that. We can take a look at nonlinear analysis. And uh, we can take a look at thermals, at heat transfer. We can take a look at dynamics and fatigue. So if we want to take a look at things like improving our product performance, reducing warranty issues, that's where a fatigue analysis is going to come into play. And then we can take a look at different material models, uh, plenty of metals included, rubbers and other soft tissues. Uh, you're going to be able to take a look at and analyze using this Inventor and Astrian software. We can take a look at the Inventor Cam add-in. So this is going to help you simplify your machining workflows. We have a CAD embedded two and a half axis to five axis milling and turning and mill turn capabilities. Seamless workflows to rapidly turn designs into machine parts. And this is directly inside of Inventor. So we can take a look at a roughing strategy or advanced roughing strategy uh, to remove a high volume of material while minimizing your tool, machine, and wear and then powerful post-processor uh, to help you generate your CNC code. We take a look at the Inventor nest nesting add-in, nesting add-in. I tried to blend that with Nastrian. Uh, your Inventor nesting add-in. This is going to help you take a look at optimizing the yield from your flat raw material. So there's nesting studies that you can complete, which will help you optimize your efficiency, reduce costs, and export your 3D models right into DXF files. Uh, so you can send those directly over to the shop to get cut out. You can generate multiple sheet nests in a single study. You can compare efficiency and costs associated with different nesting studies. And you can specify allowable orientation to help you get consistent grain. In the last, I believe this is the last one. Yeah, the last inventor add-in that we want to take a look at is the factory design utility. So we can use this tool to help maximize our production performance. We could take a look at planning out and validating our factory and plant layouts. And maybe this is something that you've already done in AutoCAD. In AutoCAD, you have a flat 2D drawing of your factory layout. Uh, you can use that for maintenance, for planning out machine layout, where things go to help you define production. And that's what this utility is meant to do. It's meant to take that and turn it into a 3D model for you. Uh, so you can easily design and manage those 3D uh, machines. You can see some screenshots here of some of those different machines in place. They don't have to be perfect models. They could be simplified models of those, of those layouts. And then we can help visualize, detect clashes in our large facilities. Uh, we could take a look at time studies, processes, to see how things move through the shop. And we could do that all in a 3D file. We take a look at a couple of the connected applications. So these are applications outside of Inventor and AutoCAD, uh, but these are applications that you can connect with and that you can work with starting off with an AutoCAD file or an Inventor file. So we take a look at Navisworks Manage. And Navisworks Manage is going to help us coordinate different file types into one so that we can load up different file types. Maybe we have some Inventor files, some AutoCAD files, and maybe even some files from over on the BIM side, the architectural side. We can use Navis to help combine those into a 3D file 
so that we could take a look at things like walkthroughs. Right? You can see the screenshot there, or clash detection on the right. Uh, so it's going to help us combine all those different file types, kind of take what we just saw in factory design utility and put it on steroids so that we can combine all those types and we can see some more detailed information. Recap Pro is a really cool software. Uh, this is going to allow you to create high quality digital models of your real world assets. Uh, so how do we do that? We could do that with laser scan technology. We can even do it with pictures. If you have a camera, uh, for example, or a GoPro attached to a drone and you do a site survey and you take a bunch of pictures, bunch, a bunch, a bunch of pictures of it. Uh, you can load that into this software and it'll create it'll create point clouds which you can then use to create high realistic models similar to what you see on the right hand side or even on the left hand side with that other site layout so you can do laser scans of internal spaces i guess external too as well uh, you could do laser scans you could do imagery and you can generate out these survey grade uh, 3d models Really fantastic tool, especially if you need your products, your designs, whatever it is you're working on, to attach to or to sync up with uh, or to exist with something in the real world already. And then we'll take a look at 3DS Max. So 3ds Max is another fantastic tool that we can use. And this one's gonna help us create some powerful imagery, powerful rendering tools. Uh, so if we wanted to take our designs to the next level with our imagery and with our designs, and we wanted to get really realistic, lifelike imagery, that's where 3ds Max is gonna come into play. It's a modeling tool, it's a rendering tool, and even an animation software. So we can create things like expansive worlds if you wanted to. Uh, or you can just breathe life into your, uh, your models that you make. You can see them in a realistic setting, how they're going to look and interact with the space around it. The Autodesk Vault software is also included with the collection. The Autodesk Vault software is where we can manage our data. We can also do things like standardized data and processes. Uh, we can take a look at managing teams and working with our data uh, in more than just one environment. We can also look at the mobile applications for it. And this is where we can do things like manage our data, easily do things like a copy design, where if we make a similar design over and over again, Copy design is a really fantastic tool uh, to help you take that initial design, make a complete copy of it, and be able to work on a completely new version. It also offers version control. So every time you check out and work on that file and check it back in, it creates a new version, which establishes a version history so that you could theoretically go back in time and grab a previous version of that file that you're working on so if you decide to change paths or if you made a mistake several versions back, you can always go back to that previous version, pull it to the front, and work with it from there on out. So those two main functions, version history and copy design, fantastic tools uh, if you're working in Inventor and even in AutoCAD, uh, just to help you capture your designs, manage your designs, and, uh, and be able to work with them. And then the final uh, looking at the software that we wanted to do is let's take a look at the Fusion 360 software. So this is a cloud-based 3D modeling tool. You might think, well, that sounds similar to Inventor. Well, Inventor is a 3D modeling tool, of course. Fusion 360 is cloud-based. It offers a lot of different functionality, including 3D CAD, uh, Manufacturing processes like 3D printing or CAM workflows, PCB design, simulation, tools like generative design, which is a fantastic tool uh, to help you design parts um, using AI technology 
Uh, so you could take your, your standard block of a part, if you will, you could throw it into generative design, it'll send it up to the cloud uh, with your key parameters noted or your key locations noted, and it'll come back with these, these fantastic looking files uh, that you can then use 3D print uh, or 3D manufacturing um, in order to do things like cost and weight reduction, mainly weight reduction in that scenario. And it's also a cloud tool. So the items like 3D simulation and generative, generative design, those are cloud-based. So you're not relying on your machine, your local computer to run that analysis, or you're not relying on it to run that simulation. Uh, the other tools like CAD files and working with a team, it's all cloud-based tools. So we can easily collaborate between team members. We can actively see who's working in the document, uh, who has control, and a history of who saved and who did what. All right, so let's take a look at some workflows now. And that's really the, the meat of this webinar. Um, now that we did an overview of what's included in the software, let's try a couple of these workflows out. So the first one is, let's take an AutoCAD file, a pretty standard AutoCAD part file, and if we wanted to bring that into Inventor and use it as a basis for creating a part, a geometry, let's take a look at that workflow first. So let me switch over to Inventor. I'm going to start off with a new part, just a standard new part. Go. Let me make sure I get my notes in the right spot. Bear with me. Got too many things happening on one screen. There we go. All right. So I got my inventor uh, new file open here, just a brand new file. I'm going to go ahead and save that first. And I'm going to call this underlay. So I got my file open. I'm going to go to manage. And I'm going to find my import command. And I'm going to bring in my AutoCAD drawing file. I'm going to open that up. I'm going to place it on my XY plane and right on the origin point. This is letting me know that it's creating an associative link to that AutoCAD file. So anything that I create from here is gonna be based on projected geometry and it's gonna be associatively linked back to that AutoCAD file. I'm gonna click okay to that. So there's my, uh, my AutoCAD file laid in on my file. All right, let's take a look at a couple of things we can do with that. I'm going to go to layer visibility I'm going to turn everything off except for the main geometry layers. So my hidden edges, my tangent edges, and even my visible edges. So I'm going to turn off basically my dimensions, uh, my hatching, section views, stuff like that that I don't need uh, for this workflow. I'm going to turn on the visibility of my origin point. And it's actually going to be hiding down here pretty far uh, down off of that view but I can use a tool like Translate and I can locate, locate, I said, the center point of this view to my origin point. So now the center point of that view, of that hole in that view is gonna be located right on the origin point. Then I'll create a sketch on that plane. I have a special project command, project DWG geometry, uh, found on my project dropdown. And that's gonna help maintain that associative link. I uh, get, get a toolbar here to help me choose the type of projection that I wanna do. I'm gonna switch this one back over to line. And I'm gonna work my way through here and grab these outer edges of this view. So I've projected into geometry that I cared about. I've also projected in this side because I'm going to place a reference dimension 
It's going to tell me that's a reference dimension, which is fine. I'm going to actually use that when I go to extrude this. So I'm going to extrude this profile. Let's take a look at this from the side so we can see what we're doing here. Let's go back with that. As far as dimension goes, I'm just going to click that dimension from that edge. And it projects in that first shape for me. Okay, well now what? There's a lot of other geometry going on there. There's some holes. Uh, there's a pretty neat feature going on through the middle. There's also these fillets. So let's take a look at what we can do next. Back on my Manage tab, I'm going to go back to Import. I'm going to bring that same drawing in again. I'm going to select this face and this point. So we need a reference face and a reference point. All right. I can then translate again because it's way off to the side once again. Uh, so I can translate. And I'm going to locate this point. And it's going to attach it. It always attaches it right to that initial center point that I picked whenever I brought it in, uh, which is pretty cool. Threw me off a couple, for a couple times first time I did it this, uh, but it always attaches it right to there. Now I can use that geometry. Let's create another sketch. Actually, let's just create a sketch right on that face. And let's project in some geometry. So once again, I'll use that project DWG underlay. I'm going to pick up these four circles. I'm also going to pick up one of those fillets there. Uh, and I'm going to come over to, where are you at there? This one. And I'm going to project in the geometry of the hole. Because, once again, I want to reference in that geometry. And these are all going to be reference dimensions. But this is going to help me build my 3D model and maintain the associative link back to that drawing file, that AutoCAD file. So I got those there. I got one more to put in down here. Just the reference of that fillet. I'm going to finish up that sketch. I'm going to start my whole command. And I'm going to pick those four points. Grab that one on the back there. All right, so I got those four points located. I'm going to make that a counter bore hole. It is going to go all the way through. I'm going to pick up the first value. That's the counter bore diameter. Uh, and that's going to be that 0.75. The counterboard depth will be that point one. And that counterboard, I'm sorry, the hole diameter will be that point three seven five. So as you can see, and hopefully what you're what you're understanding here is I'm creating an associative link back to the geometry itself, uh, which is still attached to that original AutoCAD file. So what if we make changes to that original AutoCAD file? depending on how extensive those changes are, of course, we come back into Inventor, we'll see this file update with those new changes. So if we change the size of the holes, for example, uh, once we actually get this part finished and created, uh, then we'll see that change happen back here on the Inventor file. So it's an associative link, and we'll look at breaking it in just a moment. Uh, I need to share that sketch. I want to share that sketch uh, because I'm also using it to create some fillets. And I'll pick my edges. Did I get you? No, I missed that last one. Pick the edges. I'll pick that 0 0.75 dimension to create that associative link. And I'll put those fillets in there for me. All right. I got a couple, uh, a couple versions of that AutoCAD file in there. I can turn the visibility of each of those off. Here's where I can also suppress or break the link. Uh, so if I did want to do that, uh, I always have that option. So if we just want to make it, it's never going to change. Uh, we can break that link off or at least temporarily suppress it so that it's not getting in our way. One more feature here that we want to put on. Uh, so I'm going to go back and import one more time. Same file. 
and I'm going to drop that onto my YZ plane, and I'm going to put that right onto the center point. All right. This one, a little bit different workflow. I'm going to translate, and I want to locate that point. Now let's go find that. Where did it jump off to? There it is. But you'll notice it's sideways. So I can grab a hold of this and turn it 90 degrees so that it lines up properly with the view. So then if I were to go to my view tab and I take a look at my visual style and maybe change that to wireframe, you'll see that AutoCAD file sketch within that part model. All right. So then if I create a sketch on my YZ plane, and I use that same project to DWG geometry, I can work my way through here and pick up a couple of these. I'll grab those two as well. And then I'll do a sketch line straight across the center. Just to close up that geometry, that shape. I'll finish that sketch. I'll go back to my shaded with edges view before starting up my revolve command. It picked up the profile. I'll select the axis and I'll make sure that's set to a cut operation before I click OK. And there is my uh, geometry cut through there. So I could turn off the visibility of that last AutoCAD reference, even get that center point there. And there is my completed part file. Design developed from that original AutoCAD file. Uh, and like I said already once or twice, the nice thing about that, the best thing about that, is that it still maintains a link back to that original AutoCAD file. So if I did go back to that file and I made a change, I should see that update on my inventor side. Now, if you completely delete that hole that created that, uh, the geometry that created the hole, and you try to remake it, of course, it's not going to update those. It's going to blow up, actually, uh, because it's still trying to maintain a link back to that geometry. But if you just stretch those out a little bit, made the diameter a little bit larger, then it's going to pull that reference in, and Inventor's going to understand that. So that's a really cool workflow uh, that you could take a look at to take your existing AutoCAD geometry and bring it into Inventor so that you can create 3D models uh, directly from your flat views of your AutoCAD file. All right, let's get back to. I'm just going to go ahead and close that one. Put this back up on the screen. So, once again, starting with AutoCAD 2D data, jumping into Inventor and using the import tool to import that 2D drawing, and then using the AutoCAD drawing underlay workflow, including the project geometry, the import, placing a few instances of that in uh, select spots so that we can reference it in and we can create that geometry. The next one that we want to take a look at is working from Inventor to Inventor Nastran. So this is going to be an add-in within Inventor. Uh, so I'm going to get back to the correct file. I got my lever started already here. What I like about this, or what I want to show you about this, is along the top, uh, you can see some of these add-ins are already in here. Uh, so if I wanted to do something with CAM, I could switch to the CAM tab to find that add-in. Uh, Fusion 360, we'll take a look at that, so I don't want to spoil that one yet. Environments. This is where we could take a look at uh, using the Nastran software. And that's what I want to do for this one. So I want to jump into the Nastran environment. It's going to start me off in a linear static analysis. And I want to kind of run through this a little bit quickly. I'm trying to pay attention to time. Um, so I wanted to look through this. So linear static is right. I'm going to set up my material type. So I'm going to go to the library. And I've got the Autodesk Material Library, the Inventor Library, uh, and you can see that I have a lot of different materials, expanded library than what I'm used to over in my Inventor side. 
Uh, and this is either going to be steel mild or mild steel. There it is, steel dash mild. Brings in all the correct parameters, properties for mild steel. And there's my setup for mild steel. I could take a look at applying loads and constraints. Uh, I want to start with constraints. So I'm going to create a new constraint. I could do different types of constraints. This one, I'm going to use a pin constraint uh, because normally there would be a bar or rod or connector pin of some sort passing through this surface. So I'm going to place a pin constraint there. I can control the geometry color of it. I control the preview of it. Uh, that way I could see that constraint, how it builds that constraint for me. Thing looks good there. I'll create another one. And this is also going to be a pin because there'd be a second pin on this design back in this slot. And it's going to be interacting with that half of the surface. So same exact idea. I want to get good color listed there. I got to turn the preview on, I guess. There we go. Just controlling the density has nothing to do with, well, we're doing a constraint here, but it has nothing to do with loads or magnitudes. It's just how it looks. And then we'll take a look at applying a load. Different types of loads we can apply. Uh, this one's going to be a bearing load on this surface. And it's going to be in the x direction. And it should be negative 30. Preview that a little bit on the density side there, but we control how that load is being applied. So we set up our uh, our loads and constraints there. We got to take a look at meshing this. So I'm going to edit my mesh. I'm going to take this down to two. We're going to keep it pretty loose here again, just for the sake of the workflow uh, demo that I'm doing. So we're not going to get too particular with our meshing, but that's something that we would we would really take a look at if we were doing this uh, for real, of course, or if we were doing this in a training class environment. Uh, so there's a pretty rough mesh on my design. I think everything looks pretty good there. Let me go ahead and save that. We'll see if I forgot anything. I'm going to do a solve in Nastrin. Now, this does run locally. Nastrian runs locally on my own machine, uh, but this is a pretty simple part, so it should get through it pretty fast. It's running through right now. Any minute now or any second now to give me my results. There we go. Complete. And then I could take a look at those results. Um, so, just a quick overview of results. I'm going to turn off a couple things that I don't like. I'm going to turn off undeformed edges, my loads, constraint markers. That looks better. Now we can see what we got going on. Uh, I can animate this. It takes a second to load up the animation. So you can get an idea of how it's going to react. Uh, you'll be able to kind of look at your pin constraints that you did here and see how those are interacting with what you would expect from reality. Uh, of course, our results are exaggerated, so there's a bit more bending and stretching than normal. Uh, but we can take a look at the stress. And right now we're looking at the solid von Mises stress, which is your, your typical default stress result that you look at. Uh, you could take a look at different directions of normal and shear stress. Uh, all these different result types. I could switch over to uh, strain or reaction force or even displacement. So if I switch over to displacement, let's see if it keeps that animation going or not. It did. Then I could take a look at displacement. Again, total displacement, or I could break it down in any of the directions. Let's go ahead and stop that animation for a minute. Let's go ahead and turn those results back on. So we can look at those individual results. Uh, if I go back to stress for a moment, what I like is you can always switch out the units. So if you didn't want to see this in megapascals, you instead wanted to see it in PSI. It's an easy switch uh, to make that change. 
So a lot of really nice tools for uh, setting up your analysis. And we did a very quick overview of that, but a lot of great tools for setting up your analysis, really digging down into the weeds and uh, understanding what you're setting up, even what your results look like. I like to say during my training classes, it's pretty easy, as you can see, to throw a couple loads of constraints on, hit mesh and get a result. But how do we know that's correct? Well, this software has a lot of tools that are going to help us. Uh, from tools, manual tools, where we can really dig down in and uh, we could take a look at this, what looks like a pretty, you know, it doesn't look great, but it doesn't look horrible. And we can even take a look at um, jumping in and really taking a look at this element by element. And we can see, okay, well, if we take a look at this element by element, it's pretty ugly because we have red elements right next to green elements. And those are, those are classic telltale signs of uh, you definitely don't have enough mesh and you're not getting accurate results. So a lot of great tools there in our Inventor Nastran environment. Um, same can be said for the Inventor Cam environment or those other ones, factory design, utility, nesting, tolerance analysis. Uh, a lot of great tools in there to help your designs along, help your designers make those decisions early in the process, uh, which is going to save you a lot of time down the road. Let me close this one. We will take a look at the next, our third workflow. Our third workflow is going to be taking a file from Inventor, pushing it to Fusion 360, uh, and then seeing some of the tools that are available to us in Fusion 360. So here in Inventor, I have this really cool a water bottle adapter. And basically the idea is, I'll try to talk you through it since I don't have any cool pictures to show you for it. The idea of it is uh, everybody's using water bottles now, uh, or even, you know, you got your, your Yeti cups and they, they never fit into the cup holders in your car. I have that problem in my truck, the cup holders are tiny. Um, so you get your big water bottles or your Yeti cups, they don't fit into your cup holders. So what do you do? You know, you lay your water bottle on the passenger seat, by the time you hit the brakes so or the first turn, it's gone. It's buried underneath your passenger side seat along with the last three water bottles that you brought with you. Uh, so this is a pretty simple design. Uh, it's just an adapter. It fits down into your cup holder. So it's sized properly for the cup holder in my car. And the top of it sized properly to fit my favorite water bottle. Um, you can go crazy and make these things adjustable and whatnot, but hey, this is a simple design. It's made for me. I want to 3D print it. You might also notice that it's actually two parts. Uh, now in Inventor, I did it in a single part file using multiple bodies. So the bottom body has a little neat little tab there. And then the top body has a hole that that tab goes into. That's whenever I 3D print these and I glue them together. I want them to fit together properly so that they're centered. So that part's designed. I made that up quickly in Inventor, mocked it up here. I'm gonna switch over to the Fusion 360 tab, and I wanna take a look at the different Fusion 360 workflows. So I have tools from Inventor to go directly to a specific environment within Fusion 360. I go directly into generative design uh, where I can make structural components or fluid paths even now. These are fantastic tools. I can go right to simulation. Uh, so if I wanted to run a static stress analysis um, or any other type of analysis that you see here, maybe I'm getting into plastic injection molding or electronics cooling if I'm doing PCB boards, or I wanna go straight to my manufacturing environment. Or maybe I just want to go right to the modeling environment and make the decision once I get over to Fusion. So you have these cool workflows here uh, that you can jump right into that particular environment. I'm going to go modeling. It's going to give me a little bit of information about what you're about to do. It's going to ask me to put it into a particular team. Uh, so I'm just going to use my training team. I've got an empty project folder over there and it wants to know a file name that I want to send it over to. I'll click up. It's going to send it over to that team. It's going to run through its process. 
and looks like it's successful. I could do an open Infusion 360 right from here, uh, or I could just jump over to this open C Diffusion 360 that I happen to have. That was convenient. Once I get into Fusion 360, I'll go to my data panel and I'll look. Got a refresh there. My data panel, this is where I manage my data. Uh, so this is where I could see the files that I have. I could take a look at their version history. I could see who's collaborating on this project, manage who's collaborating on this project, see who's working on these files. Uh, and I could do a lot of that stuff right there in the software in that data panel. It's cloud-based, uh, so these files are stored on the cloud, not locally on my machine. And these tools, a lot of these tools like simulation, CAM, uh, generative design, it's automated by cloud resources. This is opening right now. We'll give that a moment. So here's my port file in Fusion 360. And you can see it's on its side. Um, this is a, not important at all, but basically the reason why is because in Inventor, we model in uh, Y up. You can see the Y up here. But my Fusion is set to be, oops, Z up. Uh, so it came in on its side. It's not a big deal. I'll fix that once I get over into the uh, 3D printing environment. But let's take a quick peek at Fusion. So we have our design tab where we could do our different designs and workflows. And if you're familiar with a software like Inventor, transitioning over to Fusion is not that bad. They're pretty similar. There's some differences, but they are pretty similar workflows. But we can also go to different environments. So we can go to generative, generative design. It has its own rendering environment to create renderings of your parts and components. It has an animation tab where you can build exploded views or create animations of exploded. You can run an analysis. Uh, manufacturers where we're going to go to, or you can build a drawing. So it is a 3D modeling tool, very similar to what Inventor is. They're both 3D modeling tools. Uh, and it's not crazy that they both live underneath the Autodesk umbrella. Uh, they both have their defined purposes. Um, one nice thing about Fusion 360 is these tools are cloud-based. And I mentioned that a couple of times so that I don't need to rely on my machine to run a simulation. And I don't even have access to an inventor, but I don't need to rely on my machine to run a gen design. Um, so there's different different purposes and points and different uses for these softwares. I'm going to go to manufacturer. So manufacturer is where I can go find my cam tools like milling uh, or turning. Or I can find my additive workflow. Uh, in this case, this case, that's what I'm going to do. Actually, before I did that, I forgot a step. Let's go back to design for a minute. This is still a single part file. Um, it's made up of two bodies. I need to take those two bodies, and I need to turn those magically into components. So now this has by itself or automatically became an assembly, and I have my two part files. Uh, so if I turn off my solid three with just a quick flick of the button there, that's the top part, and that is the holder. I'll switch those, visibility, and this is the insert. So I got my two components now, or two parts, in my assembly. Uh, I can ground down that insert. This thing floats away, uh, but if I turn it back to where it belongs, I can do an as-built joint, uh, which if you're talking about Inventor, we, we typically look more at constraints uh, where Fusion is relying fully on joints. And it's just a little different workflow. They both get the job done, but as-built joint is my favorite joint of all time because I don't have to select anything. I just click the two parts and it constrains them as they are. Let me go ahead and save this. That's good. So I save that file now in Fusion. I can then switch over to Manufacture. I'm on Additive, and I want to start taking a look at a setup. So again, we're 3D printing this. Uh, so my first thing I want to do is I want to select a machine. So I have a couple in my recent that I'm going to use. 
but there's also a Fusion 360 library, very, very extensive one that includes a lot of different machines. And I'm going through this list super fast. So you're probably not going to see yours uh, unless you just kind of see the general, the general ones there. But it has a lot of machines included. And any of these machines included, you could make tweaks and edits to them to fit what your machine's actually doing. Or if yours doesn't happen to be listed, you could take a close one or a similar one and you can make tweaks and adjustments to it. I'm going to grab my recent. So just tell me it needs to be updated. My print settings is where I'm going to find uh, what type of filament I'm using. Again, I can make tweaks and adjustments to that filament if I need to. I'm just going to go ahead and select that one. And then I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Click OK for, okay for placement. All right, here's where we see that those are on their side. So let me go ahead and position those properly with just a quick 90 degree turn. Now we'll click OK to that. Take this one. Same thing. 90 degree turn. Now I can look at it from the side here. All right, now I'm going to move this one over just to get it out of the way. And then we can take these and we can drop them right down onto the print bed. Snap. I can take a look at building supports. Fusion has a, a built-in support modeler. So I can select that bottom surface where that tab's at, because we need some support there. And it'll build that. I do need to regenerate my tool pass. I'll take a second. You can see my supports have been built there. So it's running its way through, checking everything. We should expect green check marks. We might get a caution symbol on this additive toolpath. And if we do, I'll, I'll point out why we got it. That actually is green. Um, you know what? We need to, that's why. There we go. It wanted to regenerate the arrangement and then regenerate the toolpath. You're going to make me generate this too, aren't you? Figures. There we go. Now I got to regenerate the toolpath. Apologies. Should have started from the top, worked my way down. There we go. So there we see a caution sign, and it's really just letting me know that these parts are kind of close together. So we might have some interference or some issues. I'm not going to worry about fixing that for now. Um, so I got them positioned. I got them placed on the print bed. I got supports built. Uh, toolpaths are good. I can simulate that toolpath. So if I wanted to see how it works, I can play that, try to speed that up a little bit. Uh, there's a color legend that's hiding behind this panel that's telling me what each of those colors represent, supports, uh, infills. Um, and all the rest of the, the types there. So it's going to go through that process. We're not going to sit here and watch this, of course. And then finally, I can do a post process. There's some questions here that I can go through and answer as far as file naming goes, uh, and then setting up some post properties as well. Just want to make sure that I read through all of that when I actually do this. That all looks good. I'm going to go ahead and post that. And then I can view that NC code. Okay, let's get rid of these flags and notes. And here I can see my uh, my my G code, my NC code that I can then send off to my 3D printer and get these parts glued together. And once I'm done with that, I will then have a uh, completed file. All right, so that takes a look at the three workflows that I wanted to show you. Um, let me get back over to my, my final PowerPoint slide there. So that, that takes care of those three workflows that I wanted to show you. Obviously, there's a lot more workflows that you could do with all of those different add-ins uh, and all those connected applications. 
So this is the opportunity to tell you that if you have any questions on any of these workflows or seeing any of the additional workflows, you could feel free to reach out to us. Uh, my contact information is up there on the screen. Uh, you can feel free to use me as a first point of contact and then I'll distribute it where it needs to go. Um, there's even a QR link there to my LinkedIn account if you wanted to connect with me on LinkedIn to see what I'm up to, see what I got going on. And then a link right there to our Mesa site uh, where you can uh, find contact information, direct, interact with our support team. And um, like I said, any questions you have, feel free to let us know. Besides my audio issues at the beginning, I didn't see any other questions pop in. Once again, I apologize for that. Um, glad we got that working there and we were able to save face. So if you don't have any other questions, once again, thank you for attending the webinar. And uh, I hope you have a good rest of your day. And look forward to, to interacting with you if you have any questions in the future.